The glorious reign of King Solomon was now about 200 years in the past. After Solomon died because of his sins, God had caused Israel to split into two nations, Israel to the north, Judah to the south. Hezekiah was named Judah's king during a period of great disruption and discouragement in the nation of Judah. In Hezekiah's day, a crisis was looming over the land of Judah. The prophets Isaiah and Micah were given a message to warn Judah that the same kinds of disaster faced them as took place in the northern kingdom of Israel. Just for a reference point, there was about a 135-year gap between the downfall of the capital of Israel, Samaria, in about 722 BC, and then 135 years later, 587 BC is when the fall of Jerusalem and Judah occurred. There were a few events, though, that happened in Judah during Hezekiah's reign that held back God's full judgments on the nation. Who was this man, Hezekiah? What kind of a man of character did he turn out to be? And what were some of the events Hezekiah and the nation would endure to test their faith and that would be recorded in three Old Testament books? namely 2 Chronicles, 2 Kings, and Isaiah. And today we're going to just focus on passages from those three books. This message is going to look at two connected events in King Hezekiah's life that tested him as well, whether or not he would give God the glory. And this would be uh, a teaching lesson for all of us as it is recorded in the pages of the Bible. My title today, Give God the Glory. Give God the Glory. Please join me in 2 Chronicles 28 and verse 1 as we get started. 2 Chronicles 28 and verse 1. And if you happen to have three different little markers, we're going to... Um, circulate between, again, those three Old Testament books, starting here with Second Chronicles 28 and verse 1. Right now, I'll give you a little bit of family background as you're turning. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he succeeded his father Ahaz to the throne of Judah. Let's see what kind of a legacy King Ahaz left Judah with and left his young son with. Verse 1. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord as his father David had done. You see, David, King David was the gold standard for many kings to succeed in both Judah and Israel. And so when we take this reference, even with a man who had his weaknesses and had his sins, he always faithfully turned back to God for emotional healing, for cleansing of his sins, for leading an upright life, and striving to do what God asked him to do. So David is always the gold standard here. Verse 2, back to Ahaz. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made molded images for the Baals or Baals. He burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and he burned his children in the fire, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. When you see this in this Old Testament scriptures, it's talking about this giant brass cast, monstrous looking image that had a furnace in its belly. It was the god Molech of the Canaanites. And we see certain kings and times that it was such an appalling abomination to God when people would take their newborn infants and set them in these hands or roll them into the furnace of their in, in, innocent little children, appeasing some Canaanite god. God said that was a horrible thing for them to do. Let's continue. Verse 4. 
He sacrificed and burned incense in the, on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Verse 19. Verse 19 tells us that God brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he had encouraged such a moral decline in the nation that Judah had also followed the king's pattern and his example and that they suffered for a while God's incremental curses on Judah. There were incursions of the Assyrians as they were conquering nation after nation and nobody could stop in the Assyrians' way. They were the, they were the known power in the world at that time. Ahaz was forced into an agreement to pay tribute to this great Assyrian empire. Verse 21 tells us Ahaz has also taken part of the treasuries of the temple to appease the Assyrian king, but it did not buy him the security he had hoped for. So he was robbing the temple in Jerusalem of some of the fine gold and, and silver and other very precious things to give to the Assyrian king to try to, try to appease him. Uh, as, as tribute. Let's skip now to verses 22. And we're in 2 Chronicles 28, verses 22 through 25. Now in the time of the, his distress, King Ahaz became increasingly unfaithful to the Lord. This is that King Ahaz. I thought it's interesting. I, I read that over and over again, and I, I guess it's making, it's driving home a point. This Ahaz was something very wicked in Judah. This is that King Ahaz. For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him, saying, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. So Ahaz gathered the articles of the house of God. He cut in pieces the articles of the house of God, shut up the doors of the house of God. We're talking about barring the doors of the temple from any access by the priesthood or others. He made for himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem. And in every single city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense to other gods and provoked to anger the Lord God of his fathers. You see, Ahaz had a very short reign. He only reigned for 16 years. His life was cut short at age 36. But he almost brought Judah to total ruin in those 16 years. So think about it with me for a moment. He, Ahaz leaves a horrible legacy to his son to pick up and continue the reign over Judah. Horrible. And the Assyrians were already encroaching on the outskirts of Judah and putting pressure on them and forcing them to pay tribute. Now, just a few years before Hezekiah became king, he lived in a time when the Assyrians had already completely destroyed the cities of Israel to the north. Now, Hezekiah was very much aware that Judah could fall completely also into the hands of the Assyrians and be utterly ruined. So he had this awareness. It would be like us here in the United States watching Canada, our neighbors to the north, be overcome by a foreign power and, be, and their, their soldiers sent to battle and coming home in casket. It would be that kind of a thing that would right be at our borders if something like this were a parallel in today's day and age. The success of the Assyrians, once again, they were conquering nation after nation. Nothing could stop them. And that was making them very proud and arrogant of their victories. Hezekiah, it's easy to see here now that he was facing a national crisis. And when you think about our presidents of the United States over the long history of our presidents, they always seem to have at least one crisis in their term of office that helps form a legacy. And there's either a war or there's some other major issue that goes on that tests American presidents 
in a crucible. And any, any president or leader or king or prime minister of any nation, they often go through these major crises. And Hezekiah was no different. If we do look at for some parallels occurring in the modern day Israel of the Bible, and you know what I'm talking about, basically the English speaking peoples of the world, the British Commonwealth nations, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, United States, you see to some measure we appear to be drawing closer to a similar time of testing in these nations. I was listening to a little bit of news with with my wife yesterday, I was watching Fox Business News. Neil Cavuto comes on in the afternoon. His daily show is called Your World. He said something uncanny, I'll share it with you, and I'm not placing a lot of weight on this, but it's very interesting how he was talking about some of the issues we're facing that people are finding a very difficult time financially right now in the, in the United States. He said, Retail inflation is now back to where we were 40 years ago, and he's referencing 1981 when we had the highest inflation and interest rates uh, in our, most of our lifetime. He says, how people feel about the future is at or around a 40-year low. Meat prices are the highest at about 41 years. What's going on with this 40-year thing? Is someone trying to tell us something bad that we're in for something big, just like we were then. And so I, I rewound that and I said, that's an interesting perspective. Now, I don't know if Neil Cavuto is uh, uh, up on prophecy. I don't know that at all, but it just sounded like something, wow. He sees something here that uh, there's a 40 year issue here. Uh, we know from Bible numbers and Bible history that 40 is a number God uses for a period of testing. 40 years, generally for a period of testing. I don't know. I just thought I'd share that with you. I won't turn, but Proverbs 14, verse 34 is a principle. I won't turn. Proverbs 14, verse 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any peoples. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach any peoples. And another principle, Proverbs 28, verse 28 says, when the wicked arise, men hide themselves. Good people go into hiding. Well, that's kind of the background that was happening in Hezekiah's day, or Ahaz's day, when we see this enormous inertia for a young king, Hezekiah, to come into pick up the reins of his father when his father died and to be king and to try to undo all the damage that his father had done. Again, Ahaz neglected justice and righteousness. He introduced false gods. He burned infants in this carved Canaanite god of Molech. Think about, again, some of the parallels that we might see in this country and also think about what happens if a ruler sets things right, tries to do what's right. Well, God would prosper his efforts if that were to happen. Proverbs 29, verse 2, another short one-sentence principle. Proverbs 29, verse 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. And those principles are true with any government in any form of governance on earth. Hezekiah was listening to the words of Isaiah and Micah, two prophets who remembered God's, uh, to, to deliver God's message, and Hezekiah was probably reading the warnings of the curses that would come upon their nation if they forgot God. Let's please turn to 2 Chronicles 29, verse 3. We're in this neighborhood here. Second Chronicles 29, verse 3. When Hezekiah first took to the throne, his first agenda item was to restore the temple services that had long been neglected. Remember, he's 25 years old, but he's a man of action. He gets to work right away. 
Sometime during the reign of Ahaz, the temple had been barred shut again. Uh, all the temple services were brought to a halt. Let's see this renewed zeal that rallied the common people in Judah to set things right. These are the kinds of things that God stops and really takes notice of. Second Chronicles 29, verse 3 through 5. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, that would be around Passover, Aviv in Hebrew, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Then he brought in the, tree, the priests and the Levites and gathered them in the east square and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves. Sanctify the house of the Lord your God of your fathers and carry out the rubbish from this holy place. It must have been left in shambles as he, his father locked the doors of the temple. And you can start to see a leadership principle here. Uh, a lot of you know that I have really enjoyed reading books by John Maxwell. One particular one, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, is one of his more popular of many books. He has down in that book a principle number 14, which is to say leaders incorporate a buy-in, a buy-in with those people that they're leading. And in this case, Hezekiah is working with a buy-in from all the Levites and the priests. He calls them up first because they're in leadership. And then he gets them busy helping to reform what his father had really caused so much damage to. The principle is that the population must first buy into leadership, then they can buy into the vision of the leader. This was just the beginning of a remarkable turnaround. Hezekiah opened the temple. That means he reinstituted the ceremonies that had been neglected for who knows how many years. He renewed a covenant with God to dedicate his efforts to bring true worship back to the nation. There was the systematic tearing down of the pagan places of worship that were set up on all the street corners in Jerusalem and throughout the whole country. Then there was the renewal of the Passover and unleavened bread uh, observances. And the zeal and the joy of the whole nation was so great that it says that they kept the days of unleavened bread an additional seven days after the first seven days of unleavened bread. They kept another seven days. Hezekiah spent his entire reign reversing the evil policies of his father Ahaz. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 31, verse 1. 2 Chronicles 31, verse 1. This is right after the 14 days of celebrating the days of unleavened bread two times in a row. It says, Now when all this was finished, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah and broke the sacred pillars into pieces, cut down the wooden images, threw down the high places and the altars from all Judah. It takes a strong rallying leadership uh, buy-in again, if you will, for the common people to go back out of Jerusalem after those holy day, uh, the Holy Day week and go back all into Judah and tear down all these pagan idols from everywhere they saw them. It says, from all Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh, until they had utterly destroyed them all. Then the children of Israel returned to their own cities, every man to his possession. This again is one of those instances where God takes notice. Uh, here's a personal thought on just musing over this study uh, I've really come to dislike the term reimagine because it's been hijacked by a woke group of elitists reimagining policing, reimagining prosecuting crimes. You've heard this for a couple of years now. Well, I'm going to use the word imagine, okay? Imagine for a moment with me the majority of common people of our country, if they were inspired by a leader whose character and conviction reflected God's way of life, 
and was able to rally a great majority of Americans to close down every porn website, every brothel, burn every X-rated movie, filter out all the vile movies of Hollywood, doing some house cleaning on HBO, Cinemax, and Showtime, and put a stop to the wholesale destruction of 800,000 innocent unborn children every year in abortion clinics. Can you imagine if something like that took place, such a revival and such a renewal of godliness? Wow. I know you're thinking in the back of your mind, Mr. Moen, you're just dreaming. Is this really, is, could this actually ever happen? Well, it happened in ancient Judah. I'm sure there would be a flurry of protests there would be civil rights lawsuits. There would be atheists screaming at the top of their lungs if something like that happened. But again, God would watch with great interest if our leaders would rally such a sweeping reform. We're still in 2 Chronicles 31. Let's go to verse 20. Verse 20, thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah. He did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God. And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandment to seek his God, he did it with all his heart, and so he prospered. Hezekiah is listed in the Bible, along with Josiah, as two of Judah's finest kings for their reforms. And he was very successful at getting the religious leadership to buy into those reforms, as we saw. And then the people tore down those pagan idols and worship places and destroyed them and went back to their hometowns. You and I, don't we look longingly for leadership to speak out against the nation's wrongs and to live by the values that helped make this nation great? Well, I do, certainly. This coming November will be midterm elections. Candidates will try to win the confidence of the public by tapping into different sentiments and different appeals they can make. And many millions of dollars are going to be spent on campaigning. What are the big issues right now that will probably still be there in November? Inflation is the number one issue, 32% of voters in a recent poll. This was a, um, a Harvard-Harris poll survey that took place on March 23rd and 24th, very recent. So inflation is number one. Next, 27% said the top issue was the economy and jobs. Then 21% said immigration. And that, again, are just the top major concerns among Americans right now. You and I know the problems that this country faces have roots that run very deep in terms of the moral climate of this country. Again, Proverbs 14, verse 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any peoples. We are reminded by Paul's words to Timothy that we're to pray for all those who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. I bring this up again because I know that this is a time in our lives where we don't know exactly where God is going to lead our leadership in the, the pattern of voting that this country has. Uh, we are what we call a representative democracy and a constitutional republic, so things are a little different than they were under a sovereign king in Judah, a little different. We have three branches of government executive, legislative, and of course the judicial. And the words and actions of the highest offices of the land carry a great influence in this country. They do, they carry a great influence. The speakers of the two houses of Congress, the Attorney General, other top positions can make decisions, good or bad, as it faces this country, and yet we're seeing so many uh, outrageously foolish decisions being made. So we are admonished to pray for our leaders that we may continue to lead peaceable lives. Let's hold our place in Second Chronicles. We'll come back here. Please come with me to Isaiah 38, verse 1. 
Isaiah 38, verse 1. Now there's a turning point in the story. Hezekiah was suddenly stricken with a fatal disease or a fatal illness. And his case was beyond the power of man to help, it appears. I mean, it doesn't look like there's anyone that could help him. The story is so moving. Perhaps that's why it's recorded in these three places, Second Chronicles, Second Kings, and Isaiah. So Hezekiah is lying in his deathbed. He's probably lost all hope of recovery when the prophet Isaiah comes with a message directly from God. Isaiah 38, verse 1. Let's read. In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. If you read that carefully, it's not even a conditional prophecy. It's like, this is what I have determined. Set your house in order. You're going to die, Hezekiah. Can you imagine hearing that from a known and vetted prophet of God that tells, tells such a statement as that? Now, Isaiah was up in age by this time. He had prophesied through several kings. He had seen many things in Israel and Judah. He delivered God's word faithfully. What would you and I do if we had nowhere else to turn? Well, Hezekiah had one more thing he could do. He could pray. And pray he did. He could still pray and bring his appeal to the one God who had been his refuge and his strength his very present help in trouble. Verses 2 and 3. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall. He prayed to the Lord, and he said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. That was a heartfelt prayer. That was the only prayer place he could turn to is to pray for God's mercy. Now he lay dying. He was only 15 or 16 years into his reign. He's still a young man. He's probably 41 or 42 years old, Hezekiah. 41 or 42. And the kings of Israel and Judah, when they were successful in their reigns, they generally reigned for 40 years or more. Verses 4 through 6. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, okay, Isaiah, he's probably walking out the porch down the road from where Hezekiah is in his deathbed. God turns him around. Isaiah, go back, tell Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. Surely I will add to your days 15 years. I'll deliver you in the city from the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend the city. A very remarkable sudden change of heart that God has because of the dynamics of watching the change of heart or the humbling of Hezekiah. We serve a God that can be entreated. This is very important to always remember. Now, God doesn't always know the outcome of everything we're going to think, do, or say tomorrow, the next day, next year. He watches us, though, with a yearning that we will grow closer in a relationship with him. Yes, it says in the scriptures, God knows all things. He certainly knows everything in the present and in the past. He knows when every bird falls out of a tree. He knows and has counted every hair on our head and every star in the sky he has named. He knows everything about the present. But he watches and he waits to see our response to him. Let's hold our place. We'll come back to Isaiah later. Let's go to 2 Kings 20 and verse 8. 2 Kings 20 and verse 8. So 
Isaiah, as he turns back and he goes to bring the second message to Hezekiah, you can imagine how overjoyed he was to share this good news, this news of assurance and hope. Let's pick up this storyline now. In verse 8, and Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what is the sign that the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? See, he was uh, given an indication that it would be three days and he would be able to get back up on his feet and he'd be able to go back into the temple and worship God. So he's asking here for a message or a sign from God. Is that totally unusual? No, it's not. Here's some examples. Moses asked for a sign from God in the land of Midian. What did God give him? Now, this was before he was to approach Pharaoh. He gave him a staff that had miraculous powers. There was one point where God also said, okay, Moses, take your hand and tuck it into your cloak and bring it out again. And it was all leprous, all diseased. And I, that must have been a frightening moment for Moses, and he wouldn't forget. And he says, okay, God says, put it back in your cloak again and take it out. And it was healed, completely normal as it was before. Those kinds of things are not forgotten easily, not at all. And so Moses asked for signs. You remember when Gideon, in the presence of the heavenly messenger, asked for a sign, and God granted two signs involving a wool fleece and the night dew. He puts down a fleece of wool uh, in, the, in the night, and the dew surrounds it, and it's perfectly dry. He wants to see what the inverse looks like, and he asks God to do the opposite. He puts down the wool fleece the next night, I believe it is. It's soaking wet in the morning, and the rest of the ground is dry around it. And so that was, those were the signs he asked for. Elisha, what kind of a sign did Elisha ask for as he was to take the role, the mantle of uh, the, the prophet after Elijah. He says, I want to have double portion of Elijah's spirit. And so Elijah says, well, if you see me go in this chariot of fire and go up into the sky, then that will be granted to you. And it was. And so this was asking for a sign. Have you ever asked for a sign from God? Is it a right or wrong thing to do? You and I may hear different opinions on this, but there's some food for thought here. When Jesus Christ told the Jewish leadership, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, the context is one of what kind of attitude were the religious leaders asking for a sign? I mean, they've seen Jesus for three, three and a half years performing miracle after miracle after miracle opening the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, raising the dead, and they ask for a sign. <laughs> I believe it comes down to attitude and perception. In Luke 16, I won't turn. Luke 16, verse 31, Jesus gives the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. In the parable, Abraham says, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded even though one rise from the dead. Meaning Jesus is reflecting on those attitudes of the religious leadership of the day, they would not have been convinced that Jesus Christ was the Messiah if he performed a, a, a dramatic sign right in front of their eyes. They would not have been convinced, and this is what he's saying here. Their hearts were not right, and Jesus Christ was not going to stoop to their request. In a time of hardship, times of uncertainty, a personal trial, a family trial, when our faith needs bolstering, can you and I ask for a sign? Yes, we can, but we are to do it in humility, unlike the religious leaders of Christ's day. And we should also have the proper discernment to know when a sign is truly from God and not something we're misinterpreting. Sometimes people misinterpret what they think is a sign from God and it really isn't. A key point to keep in mind, God does not promise to give us a sign if we ask. And signs from God may be rare. They may be rare. But in a proper attitude and perception, in faith, maybe it is okay to ask for a sign when you think you need one. 
God may provide a specific sign when it's necessary, but it cannot be expected because God does not promise it, and when his revealed word is enough for us. All of us would love to know what the future holds in advance, but God has held that back for himself. Oftentimes, there is just no need for knowing what's ahead. God wants us to trust him. He wants us to rely on him to open the right doors at the right time, come to our aid. And if we get to a door that's not open, maybe God is asking us to wait longer or go in a different direction in this life. So that's just a little, little thought on asking God for a sign. I don't see it personally as anything wrong with it. It's just that God may or may not grant it. 2 Kings 20, verse 9. 2 Kings 20, verse 9. Then Isaiah said, This is the sign to you from the Lord eternal, that the Lord will do this thing which you have spoken. He says, Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or go back 10 degrees? And there must have been a very prominent sundial of his father. It was called the sundial of Ahaz. Verse 10, Hezekiah answered, it's an easy thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. No, but let the shadow go backward 10 degrees. So Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which it had gone down on the sundial of Ahaz. Now some interpretations show it a, a staircase of the sun's shadow changing position by 10 stairs and others by uh, a, a sundial. I don't know if this means 10 hours, we're not told, but there are 10 degrees on a sundial that the sun backs up. Fascinating, and I'm sure this was a convincing sign. In fact, we'll see in a moment that the region in Babylon must have seen this happen as well. So Isaiah pro prophet, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this, uh, let's see, this was the sign that God granted Hezekiah that God answered his prayer. And then Hezekiah, I'm sorry, and then Isaiah gives Hezekiah a formula or some kind of a remedy of taking a poultice of a compress of figs and explaining that his healing would come in three days and once again he would be able to walk with his own feet into the temple. Now in this, Hezekiah knew beyond a doubt God delivered this miraculous sign and the healing was on its way. And Hezekiah gave glory to God. We're going to return to 2 Kings. Please come back to Isaiah 38 again. Isaiah 38, if you have your marker in there. Isaiah 38 verse 9 shows after his healing the heart of Hezekiah. And he puts this in writing. Isaiah 38, verse 9. This is the writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. Verse 10. I said, in the prime of my life. Remember, he's only about 41 or 42 years old. I shall go to the gates of Sheol, the grave. I am deprived of the remainder of my years. I said, I shall not see Yah, the Lord, in the land of the living. I shall observe man no more among the inhabitants of the world. These are the things that he was, were going on in his head while he was sick on his deathbed. Skip to verse 15 with me. Isaiah 38, verse 15, what shall I say? He has both spoken to me and he himself has done it. I shall walk carefully all the years in the bitterness of my soul. Now the Hebrew word, denotes intense sorrow for the word bitterness. So it may not be the best translated word into English. Intense sorrow. O oh Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. So you will restore me and make me live. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness or intense sorrow. So he's praising God, he puts it in writing, he's giving God the glory. And then he continues, but you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, the grave, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. In, in terms of his 
repentant heart. God has forgiven him here. Verses 18 through 20, we're still in Isaiah 38, 18 through 20, for Sheol, or the grave, cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. He's making an appeal to God, saying, God, if I'm dead in my grave, I will be able to give you thanks and give you the glory. But as long as I live, I have that opportunity. Verse 19, the living, the living man, he shall praise you as I do this day. The Father shall make known your truth to the children. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs with stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. There's a person whose heart was right with God. Then verse 21, it just shows again how Isaiah said, let them make a lump of figs, apply it as a poultice on the boil, and you shall recover. Now in the next chapter, Isaiah 39, Isaiah 39, Hezekiah, it shows, is so thankful and that he has an entourage of ambassadors come from Babylon because they're happy that Hezekiah has been healed. And they also want to know something about this miraculous event that happened. It's not told explicitly, but it might be that the sun went back 10 degrees in, in, in the whole world, or at least in, in that region. I mean, uh, I, I could think of technical things that could happen uh, I was studying something on the internet recently that showed that if the Earth, it's on a 23 degree tilt all, all the time around the sun, if, it, if the tilt were changed in such a way that the spinning of the Earth never slowed down or sped up, you could actually reverse the sun in the sky by that, you know, say 10 hours and not even have anything come to a stop or go backwards. If God did something like that, there, there's a science research that shows that that could be one way that God did it. We don't know for sure. We just don't know. Someday we'll ask. <laughs> Someday I'll ask. So very good. So Matthew Henry's commentary also suggests that perhaps the Babylonians noticed this shadow on their sundials changing back 10 degrees. Isaiah 39 verse 2. As these ambassadors came to congratulate him on his recovery, Hezekiah was pleased with them and showed them all his house and all his treasures, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment, and all his armory, all that was found among his treasures. God had prospered Hezekiah, and he was very excited to show off all the precious things in his household. It says, there was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show these Babylonian um, ambassadors. Verse 3, then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said, what did these men say and from where did they come to you? Hezekiah was excited. He said, they came to me from a far country, from Babylon. And Isaiah said, well, what did they see in your house? Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that's in my house. There's nothing among my treasures I did not show them. Now is a great test for Hezekiah, and again, for our learning. The visit of these messengers from a faraway land gave Hezekiah an opportunity to magnify God to these foreign king and dignitaries, these ambassadors. Remember when Solomon did that? Solomon brought God the glory when the queen of Sheba came with all her entourage. Many, many servants came, and she sat at the feet of Solomon learning about wisdom and God's ways. This could be an opportunity that Hezekiah was handed right here to expound on all of God's benefits, his great blessings, his healing, and all these things that came from the one true God. Remember, Babylon is steeped in pagan, pagan worship. That would have given God the glory. And what a testimony for those ambassadors to take back to Babylon to share with the rest of the people that there was 
the sovereign one true God of Israel. And look what he has done for them. Well, what was Hezekiah's motive for doing what he did? We're told that pride and vanity possessed his heart at this time. He was showing off. He was exalting himself in the eyes of the Babylonian officials rather than showing that it was the one true God that did these things. So in the eyes of the foreign visitors, he exalts himself. He doesn't stop to think that these representatives were from the most powerful nation on earth at the time. And they didn't have the fear of God in their hearts or the love of God in their hearts. And that was not very wise at all. And Isaiah tells him so. It was a test of Hezekiah's gratitude. He failed to give God the glory. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles 32, 31. Let's go back there again. 2 Chronicles 32. Do you still have a marker here? And verse 31. Here the record says, However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, whom they sent to Hezekiah to inquire about the wonder that was done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. God sends tests to find out what's in our hearts. And here's one example. Had Hezekiah taken the opportunity to bear witness to God's power, his mercy, his greatness, uh, then again, the report to the ambassadors would have been a light shining in a foreign nation. Let's get back a few verses to chapter 32, verse 25. Chapter 32, verse 25. It says clearly here, but Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. God gives tests when he knows we can handle them. He must have known Hezekiah was in a position where this was a test that he could have easily passed. God reveals to Isaiah that these ambassadors were going to take all this, the mind's eye of all the treasures they saw in Hezekiah's house back to Babylon, and they're starting to get this very covetous idea of conquering and enriching their own nation with all these wonderful things. So Hezekiah had done a very foolish thing. Now, in the Bible, you'll see numerous cases of something similar to this, where people had to learn the hard way to give God the glory. When he does intervene in our lives, when he gives us success, healing, prosperity, both in small things and in large things. Remember Aaron and Moses. They had to learn the bitter lesson right at the threshold of crossing the Jordan River after 40 years in the desert. They are at a point where they have this rock and the people are thirsty for water. God is testing Moses and Aaron at this point. They failed. Moses struck a rock in the desert for water to flow from it. Moses and Aaron said to the people, must we get for you water out of this rock? God had already instructed Moses, speak to the rock. That's all, just speak to it. And the water came gushing out of the rock, but God was displeased. Must we... Moses says, get water out of this rock for all of you. Then the Lord said, spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Moses, you're going to stay on the east side of the Jordan. Someone else is going to take the Israelites across. And that, of course, would be Joshua. Nebuchadnezzar. Even, even foreign kings that God was sending his people, his prophets, his servants to be a light to, Nebuchadnezzar was cursed with the mind of a wild animal for seven years. Daniel 4, verse 29, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, 
is not this great Babylon which I have built for a royal dwelling for my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? Very heady, arrogant words. What happened? Well, again, he was suddenly changed into the mind of a wild animal for seven years. You remember what his son or grandson, it says son in some translations, Belshazzar. He knew this history. Daniel 5, verse 22. Let's see what happened. But you, his son, Belshazzar, remember when he was having a, um, a giant party with all kinds of royalty and officials, and they were all getting drunk, and they saw the handwriting on the wall. Belshazzar was petrified by it. God says through Daniel, you have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Belshazzar knew the history of Nebuchadnezzar. And he was struck dead that night, and Babylon was taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire. Remember King Herod in the New Testament times? He was struck down suddenly when he was praised as a god by the citizens of Tyre and Sidon. They were saying, he speaks like a god. He was praised as a god by those citizens, and he had heard ample testimony regarding the gospel of Jesus Christ. What happened to him? Acts 12, verse 21, on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and he died. These are sobering examples of people who knew better. And that's what God is, you know, God doesn't send those kinds of judgments to people who don't know better. What can you and I do and learn from this? Well, we can give God the glory anytime we have a daily success, a benefit, an achievement, even when we can put a lot of our own human energy and effort into something. Because it, after all, isn't it God who gives us the ability to increase wealth and to have the energy, the power, the intellect, the opportunity and the resources to do things? Yes, it's God who gives us those things. Please come back to Isaiah 39, verse 5. Isaiah 39, verse 5. Let's see what the results are here of Hezekiah's poor judgment. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. So Isaiah is saying, it looks like Hezekiah has yet to have bear some more children. He says, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. What a horrible indictment to hear this thing. You're not only going to uh, die, it's another thing, I mean, that's one terrible indictment. It's another thing to be told that your sons are going to be eunuchs in a foreign country. So, verse 8, Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. And that's true. God did not bring these judgments from Babylon into Judah until after Hezekiah's reign was finished. I won't turn, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 26. It shows how Hezekiah was really filled with remorse. It says, Hezekiah, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride that was in his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that God held back his wrath in the days of Hezekiah. But the evil deed had been done, and at a later time, probably people scratching their head at this point because Assyria is still the dominant world power. It was yet to happen that Babylon would become the next world dominant power. And this is when Judah would fall and collapse under Babylonian rule. The important lesson in the story is that we're, again, given 
often opportunities to speak about the precious gifts God gives us, his mercy, his loving kindness. When our hearts or minds are filled with gratitude and appreciation for what God has done in our lives, it, it, should, be, it should come easy. Praising God should come easy. And I'm not talking about this overdone, which we saw in the 1970s, 80s, TV shows, these evangelistic shows, where every other sentence is praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'm not talking about that at all, because that is an old, worn-out, televangelist, uh, constant use. A phrase like that tends to lose sincerity, but we certainly can bring God the glory. Our words, our acts can make positive impressions on others when we give God the glory, especially to outsiders, people that are unbelievers that don't know our way of life. In conclusion, the reign of Hezekiah was characterized by some remarkable efforts on Hezekiah's personal part, especially with the huge inertia of 16 years of evil that his father, King Ahaz, had put a uh, plunged Judah into. And there's some remarkable interventions by God that the surrounding nations, particularly Babylon, could have learned from. I have one closing passage, if you join me, in 2 Kings 18, verse 5. 2 Kings 18 and verse 5. We're told here that there had reigned no king who had done so much as Hezekiah in building up the nation that God had chosen in a time of great apostasy. When every street corner in Jerusalem had some foreign god statue set up, and under every green tree was some kind of a pagan worship center. It says in 2 Kings 18, verses 5 through 8, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor were there before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered him wherever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Today's message was about one particular lesson that Hezekiah learned that we might apply to our personal lives when God, again, has performed some wonderful deed, some help, some answered prayer, perhaps a miracle of healing, perhaps even the miracle of receiving the Holy Spirit that God expects to hear our praise and our thanks to give God the glory. And so whenever we have an opportunity to share our appreciation for all his benefits, he expects us to give him the glory. Now, in a future sermon, with troubling news reaching Judah, again from the Assyrian conquests, many would have questioned the power of the one eternal God to protect the nation. Toward the close of Hezekiah's reign, God is going to use the defense of Jerusalem to demonstrate again before the surrounding nations whether the gods of the heathen or the one sovereign God of the universe was going to prevail. Again, a future sermon.